Uh, the scientific uh, program committee who did a fantastic job was led by Libertad uh, and uh, you know it looks like a great program uh, very exciting uh, covers a lot of ground uh, so I'm really looking forward to it um, before I uh, introduce the keynote speaker uh, there's a couple of uh, logistical issues that uh, Giuseppe will uh, uh, discuss and then uh, Libertad will uh, say something and then I'll introduce the speaker Thank you very much for being here. I'm really honored to have you here. Uh, I have just a technical announcement for you. Uh, at the end of the conference today at 6.30 p.m., there will be buses in front of this building. So in front of this building, there will be big buses. You can take uh, one of these and uh, to reach your hotel. And uh, after half an hour, you will find again buses uh, down to your hotel to reach the city, um, the city center. Right, so you have a half an hour of time just to refresh a bit, and then you can reach uh, with a bus uh, the city center. And uh, um, you have uh, a dinner, um, you have a ticket, you have to collect the ticket uh, from the main desk uh, to have a pizza dinner uh, in a selected uh, restaurants in the city center. You will find a board and indication that they will accept your your ticket and you can have uh, you can enjoy this uh, wonderful su summer evening in uh, in this uh, in this city uh, at uh, mm, 11 p.m. Uh, uh, in the same location where you will be left you will find again the buses and they will uh, uh, drop you off at your hotel again okay thank you very much uh, for being here Okay, so hi everyone, very briefly. So welcome again. Um, uh, my name is Libertad Gonzalez and uh, this year I'm the program chair for this conference. This is you know, very exciting for me because I is my absolute favorite, com favorite conference ever. Um, so what that means being program chair is that, you know, all the complaints that you have about, you know, my paper doesn't really fit in this session or, you know, those kinds of things, that's uh, my fault. So you know who to, to talk to so just very briefly um we had a, a lot of submissions we had 389 uh, paper submissions in the end we have 204 uh, papers in the program so you know about half of the submissions we have a total of 53 sessions on different topics um you know ranging from health education labor migration fertility uh COVID, uh, gender and so on um we have usually six or seven parallel sessions going on at the same time. And each specific room um, typically has four papers that, you know, unfortunately we, we have about 20 minutes per paper. Some sessions have three papers um, and we had one last minute cancellation so that there is the crime session today with only two papers. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, I didn't have time to, to adjust that. The chairs are, are you can find them in the in the program. If there is if the assigned chair is not there or whatever, then you know feel free to you know to use you know the standards or the last presenter of the session can chair the session um, you know, as, a, as a default if there if there's uh, any issues. Um, as as I already told you, most papers will have about 20 minutes for presentation. In three paper sessions, you will have 25 minutes. Um, Thank you very much for sending such great papers and for being here, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Yeah, so now it's my, my great honor to uh, introduce our first plenary speaker today, Alessandra Vuena. Uh, Alessandra is a professor of economics at Stanford University and also a faculty research fellow at NBR. Uh, she obtained her PhD at Stanford and a BA from University of Toronto, so she's a native. Torino, Torino, <laughs> Torino sorry, Torino, why I'm saying that? <laughs> uh, she's also the editor of the Journal of Labor Economics, um, and she's worked on a large number of very influential and cutting-edge papers in many, many different uh, disciplines, uh, all the areas of research, in fact, that SP members are interested in. So I was just looking at all the topics you cover. It's, uh, 
you know, marriage and divorce, fertility, mortality, economics of gender, immigration, uh, migration, labor, labor supply, health economics, development. The only thing that's over, it overlaps with your list that you just mentioned. The only one that you mentioned was COVID. Uh, do you, are you working on COVID too? Paper? I don't have crime papers. So no no crime. crime. Oh, that's right. You have a COVID. Okay. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. You really uh, work on exactly all the issues we're interested in. So it's really great to have you here. And today you will be talking about cultural institutions and structural change. Um, it's over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Wilbert, for um, inviting me to um, present here today. Um, I also wanted to thank the um, organizing committee, both um, locally and, and the scientific one, um, for giving me an opportunity to um, present my work. Um, I'm thrilled to be uh, to be here uh, in, in Calabria, and I'm especially thrilled to be speaking at uh, ESPE, given um, that um, the topics that unite us all here, uh, I think, are of you know, um, great interest uh, to, to me. So I'm really excited also to be attending the, the sessions. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a ongoing project uh, with uh, three um, co-authors, Natalie Bao at UCLA, Gaurav Khanna at UCSD, and Corinne Lowe at, uh, at Wharton. Um, the title is Cultural Institutions and Structural Change, Dowry Suspensions When Sons uh, Migrate. So it will touch upon marriage, pensions and migration and gender a bit. So um, I, I hope you'll you'll find that, that it fits the, the theme of, uh, of the conference. So, of course, I, I don't have to argue with this uh, audience that uh, um, migration and particularly migration from uh, relatively lower productivity rural areas into high productivity urban areas is a strong, important engine of economic uh, development. So as economists, we've been interested particularly in within development economics of studying what barriers might exist that prevent this process of uh, urbanization and structural transformation. Um, and a theme is emerging through a large set of papers uh, suggesting that there exists uh, costs uh, to migration that have a social or psychological uh, nature and so um, this paper uh, highlights one of these uh, one of these costs. In in particular, traditionally in uh, many societies around the world, children reside nearby their parents and provide support to them uh, in old age. Um, we we might expect that with this process of um, urbanization in many instances, um, it, patrilocality, so-called patrilocality, so the notion of uh, the new generation co-residing with the um, older one, typically the, the man's family, uh, might decline. But in economies where social safety nets are still weak, so in this paper in particular, I'm to, we're talking about India, but I think this is the case in many developing countries where a lack of formal pension systems still uh, prevails there may exist a friction uh, associated with migration. So at the simple level, if you migrate to the city, who is going to support uh, your family? And, and we study this, um, this mechanism and in particular how um, a particular form of cultural institution that stems from the marriage market may help to some extent overcome this, uh, this friction and this gap. And the institution in particular that we're um, interested in studying, since we're talking about India, uh, is the uh, institution of dowry. So dowry is a payment that takes place upon marriage from the bride's side um, to the husband's side. And, you know, perhaps if you're familiar with uh, European literature from the old days, it used to be very uh, common also uh, around here. But nowadays in India has not just persisted, a large body of work has suggested that it's uh, um, actually been growing and it is a pretty substantial payment. In some uh, work, it's been shown to exceed three to four years of how, of um, individual income. In our, in our data, we're more on the order of one year of, of earnings, but still a very substantial uh, transfers. And traditionally, this transfer tended to be uh, a woman's endowment or described, characterized as a woman's endowment. But over time, the literature in economics, so there's work for recently, for example, for, 
from Shuan uh, Anderson and Chris Bidner, uh, suggesting that more and more this is seen as a market clearing price for a uh, high educated, um, higher educated, say high earnings potential uh, spouse. And what we're interested in exploring is an additional angle or an additional role that this uh, uh, payment may, may play, which is the fact that often it appears that young men will uh, compensate their parents up front uh, for their migration by transferring this liquid pool of resources that they receive when they're young prior to migration. So if you're, if you're receiving a dowry payment from your parents-in-law, you as a young man have access to liquid resources that you can use to compensate your parents and promise basically uh, upfront to support them through, uh, through this cash transfer. So this may solve some form of commitment um, friction between parents and children uh, that may come uh, from from migration, so we we have a few we have a, so some amount of anecdotal evidence that this might be happening, but we are interested in this paper in documenting basically who has control over this large pool of assets of of uh, wealth and how does that affect uh, migration uh, migration decisions. Um, to give you a, a bit more of a sense of sort of what type of empirical uh, uh, objects we're talking about, uh, particularly for those of you who perhaps have worked with uh, with data from from India, there are a few surveys that will typically um, report uh, collect data on so-called gro gross gross uh, dowry. That is the total amount of payments that a woman's family makes to the family of her husband upon marriage. So as you can see in this uh, in this. Um, in this plot, we have a uh, density for this in a survey that we collected with uh, IT workers uh, uh, in Delhi in uh, 2018. And you know, uh, 10,000 rupees is about $1,200. So these are um, sort of substantial um, payments uh, given the levels of, um, of earnings for these households. Um, of course, lots of transfers take place at the time of marriage. So some surveys also will provide um, data on what the literature has called a net dowry. So meaning the difference between what is being transferred by the groom's family, uh, the bride's family and the groom's family. So a, a net payment, which is what is being um, retained by the groom's uh, side upon marriage. So as you can see, this is a more widespread uh, distribution. It can be negative. So in some cases, the groom's family is contributing more than it's receiving, uh, but it is still centered more to the, to the right, suggesting that typically in India, when your son gets married, you're, go you're li more likely to gain financially uh, than the opposite. Finally, in our in what we can collect with this uh, with this data, and I'll tell you more about how we did that, is who gets to keep this uh, uh, pot of money and how is it allocated across uh, generations. And in particular, we collect how much of this um, um, liquid pool of assets uh, ends up being in control, not just liquid, actually liquid in some cases, um, semi uh, liquid pool of assets is controlled by the groom's uh, parents. And as you can see, this is a pretty widespread distribution, somewhat centered around zero. This means that for about half, uh, a little less than half of families, if you have a son who gets married, you're going to receive some uh, liquidity, some, some money up front uh, upon marriage. And as we're going to see, this is highly correlated with migration of your son. In other cases, though, and this is a little over half of households, you are net contributing to your son's uh, uh, finance, finances by uh, transferring money directly um, to, uh, to, the next, uh, to the next generation. So in this paper, we study this phenomenon, sort of the sharing of this pool of, of wealth and how it might affect uh, migration in a simple model of intergenerational reciprocity where migration introduces a friction in the ability of sons to support their parents, which is seen as sort of their more traditional uh, role. Um, dowry being this liquid pool of assets that a young man accesses typically before migration can help alleviating this, uh, this friction. The model will deliver some uh, predictions. In particular, it will say that the presence of this institution, the fact that dowry payments exist, um, might uh, in some instances promote migration. It may make uh, investments, uh, um, public investments that um, such as roads, we're going to study a large road construction program in India, uh, and we will document how in communities where dowry is prevalent, 
um, building these roads promotes uh, migration from rural areas to the cities. And we're also going to use this novel data that we collected to document some facts about the sharing of, uh, of wealth across, uh, across generation. So let me uh, jump into uh, quickly into the outline. I'm going to start by giving you just a few more words about uh, the context, um, but mostly uh, I wouldn't briefly talk about our model and its predictions, and then we'll we'll go over the data. Um, oh, one thing I, I should have said at the beginning, I'm very happy to be interrupted for questions if sort of something is unclear and so on, and then obviously we'll leave some time um, at the end. So please, leave it that, yeah. So in this case, yes, we're, we're talking about cash, uh, fin financial support, that the, so that the friction would come in, in sort of two forms. One could be cost, and we'll talk about the role of remittances too, but in the end, remittances do take place, they're not universal. Uh, there may be commitment concerns that have been at least anecdotally uh, documented, so this is something that we can indirectly test for. Um, and uh, with also the notion that potentially uh, you can substitute uh, for with cash for your for some type of in kind services that you may be able to um, work on, but for sure, yeah, dowry does not substitute for your physical uh, presence, which is another very important, um, you know, so, um, socio uh, psychological cost that perhaps many of us don't, as migrants ourselves uh, know about. Um, so what I just want, I, I think I gave a bit of a summary already of what um, of what dowry is and how um, it's, uh, I mean, it's the way it's been understood and the economics literature has been shifting as more of a uh, bequest to daughters. That was very important work by Botticini and, and Xiao, for example, on this topic from Italy, actually from, from Tuscany. And, uh, and more recently, how it's become really this universal um, payment that takes place all over India. Uh, has really taken um, uh, taken over uh, various regions of the country where it didn't really historically uh, exist, and um, and how it does appear that women have progressively lost controls over these these resources. And so, what we're interested in is now seeing whether it has become also an intergenerational transfer to some extent from the older generation from the woman side to the young one, and now from the young generation uh, to the older, and whether that can can support uh, urbanization, or um, this is why we, we talk about structural transformation in the, in the title. Um, but let's, um, let me fix ideas, hopefully, with our uh, model, which I think is, is quite, um, quite uh, straightforward. But we're interested in a intergenerational uh, consumption allocation model where parents and children share uh, resources. So we turn to a collective model that I imagine many of you are uh, familiar with, which is normally applied to couples. But in, in here we're thinking about parents uh, versus uh, children, particularly parents versus son. And so the household is maximizing a weighted sum of the utility of each uh, generation, parents versus children. And there is a Pareto weight theta, and we're going to tell you later how we try to approximate that uh, with our data, uh, which captures the mm, weight that parents have in the household decision-making problem. So you should think this is not a full bargaining model, but often in the literature, this weight theta, this weight theta is characterized as a form of bargaining, uh, bargaining power. Parents will have their own income, uh, YP. Sons has another income in the absence of migration, just lowercase yk. Uh, and then there's two other quantities. One is if the son marries, he will receive some surplus from this marriage. And we call that E, that stands for the endowment of, of the woman. So what basically, as you'll see very soon, simply what dowry does, it makes some of this endowment liquid early on when you get married as opposed to somebody that can be accrued over time. And the fact that it's liquid means that it can be transferred. Um, finally, there is a, the possibility of migration. So that's the main endogenous variable. And if a son migrates, there is a return, capital R, to be, uh, to be earned. That's kind of, the, that is the net uh, return to, uh, to migration. So in our first best world, we are just solving a Pareto problem in the consumption of uh, 
um, parents and um, oops, I need to. Uh, I'm afraid I can't look there and talk <laughs> into the microphone at the same time. But um, maybe I can use the mouse. Let's see if this works. Uh, no, okay, I'll I'll try to do this one. Um, the the two generations in the first best just share uh, resources, income of parents, of children, this marriage market endowment, their potential returns uh, to migration. So I'm going to call everything that the household has in the absence of migration, just capital Y for simplicity. Um, and in the first best world, thanks to this is magic of the log preferences, but but you know you can get something similar with other type of uh, functional forms. Theta percent of resources will go to the parents, and one minus theta in first best will go to the um, to the children. And quite simply, in the first best world, you migrate if the returns, the net returns, are positive. So uh, there is we have a very simple notion of what is efficient uh, migration in this setting. Now, what what does migration do? And this is sort of in the absence of. Uh, um, of a dowry payment, and so then you'll see where the dowry comes in in a second. In the absence of a uh, dowry payment, and this is in the baseline model, later we will extend it to allow for remittances, but suppose that remittances cannot take place or are very costly. Well, then what happens is there's two ways in which you can try to achieve this first best or get close to the first best. One is by transferring to your son when he's young, your son, when he's young, has no resources. This YK becomes available later in life, so the transfer tau can be at most zero, going from the parents to the child. And then the, your son or you can also use this tool alpha, this other type of transfer that it's more of a later in life payment. Problem is if you migrate, that alpha cannot take place. So migration distorts the allocation of resources between uh, generations. Uh, why that might be? Well, one obvious issue are, and here we, we model it in a very reduced form way, is that there may be commitment friction. So your son moves to the city, you have no guarantee that he's going to be able to support you down, down the line. And that's actually, at least anecdotally, often a source of concern for the parents. Um, but, you know, there may be actually costs of uh, remittances uh, as well, and so we'll talk about those. Um, in what happens in a model like this with this type of friction that's being introduced by migration is that there will be sort of two types of, of households. One is a household in which parents do not expect upfront to any payment from their children, any support from their children, so they're wealthier in relative terms than their kids, so their income exceeds what their share of consumption. So there we see no distortion coming from uh, this friction, you still will migrate if there is a positive return. However, the, um, the parents will not be able to partake in this return. But there's another type of household at the moment. We've called it seeking household, but we're open for suggestions for better names. This will be instances where the, the older generation is poorer than the younger one, which we might think in a high growth nation like India, this might often be the case. So when, when, when parents do anticipate um, uh, so financial support from their children, the fact that migration distorts this uh, prospects might actually lead to fewer migration to take place because you need a higher return to migration to justify distorting the intra-household allocation. Um, what does dowry do? Well, what it simply does is it makes um, it expands the budget, the um, uh, support of the potential transfer that can take place before marriage or before migration. That is that the parent, the son now can also make a positive transfer uh, to their parents prior to migrating by tapping into the liquidity that comes from his, his parents-in-law from this uh, from this dowry payment. So that means the son, the sons can share the benefit of uh, migration prior to uh, migration taking place by transferring some liquid um, uh, assets to their parents upfront. This will, um, let me take, um, have a look at time since uh, I want to make sure I don't uh, yeah, uh, run out of time. Le these, these figures, I think, uh, can be quite um, uh, quite useful, but I'm just I'm just going to perhaps show this one. So this is in the more um, extreme cases. So suppose if you do not have dowry, you have this is a consumption of parents in the absence of migration, the consumption of children in the absence of migration. There will be a return that's high enough to justify migrating, but when that happens, the parents experience a drop 
in, in consumption because they're not going to be receiving the support they anticipate from their children and the son's consumption can increase as the returns to educate, the returns to migration uh, go up. Um, unfortunately, you cannot see now that I realize it only because of the of the video. Uh, but the simple point that we're trying to make is because with um, dowry you have more liquidity available, the jump in consumption of the parents is smaller, and therefore the return to migration that you expect to justify migration will be lower. You'll have more people uh, migrating. That's that's sort of this is sort of in the in the case where parents are tend to be poorer. Um, relative to the younger generation. Um, this model delivers a, delivers a few predictions that we can bring to the data. One is that, well, we should expect that the sharing of dowry of this pool of assets between generations to vary across households. In some households, the parents will be seeking, so will be receiving some of this payment. But in other households, for example, in households in which parents are relatively affluent compared to their children, we might expect the children to con still control most of these uh, resources. Um, we also would expect that migration will increase the sharing of um, the fraction of dowry that is appropriated by parents. So you have uh, access to these resources prior to your son migration when your bargaining power is the highest in some respects. This commitment uh, um, friction has not kicked in yet. And so you you can receive, you will receive more resources in anticipation of uh, these uh, frictions kicking in. And finally, um, holding parental wealth constant, we should expect the fraction of resources taken by the parents, this is what we call tau, the amount of resources taken, to be higher the richer the son is, and also higher the more control over um, decision making the parents have. And so we, we have some variation, can measure a little bit of that in our, in our data. Um, it, we also discuss in the paper sort of extensions that allow for remittances. One one interesting prediction there, if you say, well, there's still some probability that remittances will take place. We know that remittances are not infrequent, although among migrants in our samples, only about a quarter of um, of children who still transfer back to their to their parents. We see a positive association between remittances and how much the parents have already taken um, at the time of marriage. That's predicted by, by our model, but otherwise sort of the qualitative predictions are unaffected by the presence of remittances as long as there's always a positive probability that remittances cannot take place. Um, the last two predictions have to do with, you know, the, the sort of bigger picture, sort of how does the presence of this institution then affect uh, migration. So if you have a distribution of returns to migration in the population, sorry, you cannot see this, this figure, but there's an R here for the level of the returns. Uh, a higher, oops, a higher, um, here we go. Yeah, you, I'm sorry, you can't see it. I wonder if there is a way perhaps to move the figure to, <laughs> uh, otherwise I can tell you, well, there, there's a threshold, there's a higher because the threshold for migrating that justifies migration is higher in the absence of dowry, you'll see more the probability of migration will be higher uh, when dowry uh, exists than when it doesn't. And I think perhaps more interestingly, if you reduce the cost of migration, if you make migration easier, for example, you build roads like it's been done in the early 2000s across India. Uh, which should facilitate the movement of uh, of people from urban to, from rural to urban areas. And there's some assumptions on the distribution of um, of heterogeneity. You should expect more people responding to this policy, to the construction of roads by taking advantage of this technology when this dowry is available than when it is not. And so this relies on on the single peakness um, of of the density and on the fact that we're still in an economy where you're typically expected to be on the right of the mode. So relatively few people are still mi are migrating um, in India still uh, still today. So we have we have these um, these um, um, actually it's, it's six. I think I should have <laughs> checked the numbering. <laughs> this is the sixth. Um, I have a few predictions. We can now it's. Uh, that's the broccoli. Um, oh, I could have probably done it myself then. 
Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was told to not touch and I didn't know. <laughs> Apologies. All right, so um, now I can we can jump into uh, some data to see whether um, indeed uh, basically this institution can affect uh, the occurrence of uh, of migration, or and at a minimum sort of if we do uncover patterns in the data that are consi consistent with um, uh, with our model. And so to do that, we begin by collecting some data uh, ourselves. Um, we started by uh, gathering data for, among migrants or at least sort of young IT workers, mostly my, migrants. This was a initial data collection we did in 2018, surveying um, a little over 550 uh, IT workers in a suburb, uh, in a tech uh, suburb of, uh, of Delhi. And there we're able to I can ask very detailed questions about how this pool of resources of ca of liquid, typically cash, but there's also jewelry, gold, um, and other sort of semi-liquid uh, goods uh, that the, these men obtained at the time of marriage. How it's distributed nowadays? Who who controls it? Who can sell it? Who can keep it? And then we supplement this with a larger data collection that we were ready to kick off in February 2020. And then you might imagine what happened. So this was moved um, to the phone. So perhaps we weren't able to ask as many questions as initially planned. But um, we have uh, surveyed um, a little over 2,500 uh, households across uh, um, six states uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout India asking again to the parents this time questions about the distribution of of the dowry particularly how much they had they had taken and we spent a fair amount of time designing the questions to go around the potential desirability uh, biases and also technically uh, dowry is illegal in in India since 1961 so we never use the term dowry we talk about gifts um, and as shown also in other data sets, this seems to get uh, this seems to be enough to uh, collect meaningful uh, data about about the phenomenon. Um, just a few, maybe perhaps I'll I'll skip the summary uh, statistics to jump into how we um, construct this measure measure of dowry. We simply iterate over different types of um, means that could be transferring cash and jewelry are still the most uh, the most important and. Um, in different surveys with different degrees of detail depending whom we were talking to so when we talk to the to the sons we can ask about everything when we talk to the parents we ask about what they have received we, we can investigate the uh, the distribution of this uh, of these assets and what we measure here what sort of we're interested in in explaining is the difference basically between what the the bride's parents have uh, uh, given um that has what fraction of what's been given by the bride's parents was taken by the groom's parents minus what the groom's parents themselves have given. And in some cases, they, there's this final thing, which is in some instances they give something that then they take back. So we don't we don't count uh, for that. That's, um, and so here's the first kind of simple cutoff that uh, at the data in sort of in line of our prediction. So this is how much the bride's family gives and how much the groom's family gives. So as you can see, there's very little happening at the bottom in the bottom quadrants. So in most of these uh, families, the, the bride's family is a net giver. So we know there's actually a growing body of literature showing how economically burdensome can be to support. Uh, to face the wedding of your daughter financially, given the costs associated with it. But then when it comes to the groom's parents, some of them are net givers and some of them are net takers. And it's pretty split between the two. So that, that for us was a big motivation to get started on this because it wasn't obvious what would be driving and why would, would this matter. On average, parents control about 42% of, um, 40, uh, 41.5% of total resources with the grooms also keeping a large share. So women have very limited control over this uh, transfer. Even though it's seen traditionally as a woman's bequest, perhaps it was a case in Renaissance Tuscany when the uh, influential papers on this um, field were, were written, but it seems that nowadays that, that role has, has uh, declined. And a few a few empirical facts. This is sort of uh, no, correlationally we see that um, two phenomena explain taking from the parents. One is if 
the, the son and the parents live together, then obviously everything is intermingled. And so it's you know, to some extent the who controls what is a bit more nuanced. But the other thing that explains um, uh, taking on the part of the parents is if the son is a migrant. And so we see that in uh, in these sort of in the first row. And in particular, though, not, not if he's any migrant, if he's actually a low occupational score migrant, there is really no taking. It's entirely driven by sons with relatively high um, occupational scores. So if your son is going to migrate and have a good earnings in the city, then you're very likely upfront to be to have taken a fair amount of, of his resources. So that's consistent with intergenerational uh, reciprocity. Um, um, sorry, I want to make sure I'm not skipping. Oh, yeah. And then um, another thing that we can investigate, particularly in our destination survey, we have asked uh, um, the young migrants whether they would consider marrying without their parents' consent. And this, well, for most uh, of our respondents, this is actually pretty unthinkable. So parents uh, carry a huge amount of bargaining power the, uh, over the choice choice of, of marriage. And those parents who have this type of control, so have veto power, for instance, on the choice of bride uh, for their um, sons are much more likely to take. Of course, this is correlationally, so we can say that this is causal, um, but it does appear at least consistent with um, with the notion that at the moment when they have the highest bargaining power, um, parents seem then to be receiving more resources in anticipation of their son's migration. This comes from the destination server where most of the sample is uh, is migrants, although there are some men whose parents are in Delhi uh, that we can use to identify Sorry. Can the I, main effect. Can I, can I yes. bother you with a question? Here, yeah. here. Oh, yeah, hi. Uh, so there's something you don't mention yet is the number of kids you have. So basically, I mean, if you have tw 12 kids, it's easy to get some to migrate. And then the mechanisms are very different, or are you going to adjust depending on how many migrate? Because the number of diaries, depending on the number of sons you have, might change. So I'm, I'm not seeing this in, in, in your story yet, so I don't know if it's coming as a, like fertility decisions and migration and diaries are very linked, the three of them. Yeah, thanks. This is a great question. In fact, it's something, um, well, in terms of migration per se, uh, this is something oh, I, I don't think I have a table for, but it's something we've started exploring. It does appear perhaps not too surprisingly, well, you're more likely, the more brothers you have, the more likely you are you're, to be a migrant if you're like the one sibling. We ask about one or almost two children per household because it's on the phone, we can't keep them an hour and a half <laughs> as we had initially planned. Um, but for for the um, son that we uh, randomly pick to ask questions about um, if if the more, and actually this is true also in a national representative data set in the Indian Human Development Survey, having uh, sons, having brothers increases your own chances of migration, having sisters reduces it, perhaps because it's it's costly uh, um, to, um, to support them, but this is um, through the marriage process, but this is speculation, so um, it's still a work in progress. But here we're interested in whether you have taken uh, from your, you've taken liquidity or money from when from the pool of dowry transfers that your son uh, had access to when he got married. So this is, the, and so in this case we didn't, I, as far as I remember, we didn't see that having siblings made a significant difference on how much, um, or whether you've taken or not, at least on the um, on the intensive margin. We have tried to versions with individual fixed effect. It does seem that you take a bit more from the well, from the sun that eventually does better, but um, but it's not statistically significant once we have the uh, household fixed effect um, because of, there's still um, you know we don't have that large of a sample of re of um, repeated uh, surveys within the same or questions within the same household. Uh, but yeah, for sure, sort of these we're looking at sort of one angle of this intra-household uh, migration decisions and the siblings is also a very relevant one also when we think about old age support. Um, thanks. Um, oh yeah, getting going back to the, um, to the, we also asked about remittances because our model has this prediction that you transfer to your parents because you think that they're going to need it. And then, you know, perhaps you will also remit later on. There's no certainty about that. And this, this uncertainty might might explain why they take up front. And indeed, uh, my grandsons 
um, if you have a son who is a migrant and who remits, who's been giving you, transferring back to you, you're also more likely to have taken out of that initial pool. So it's not a substitute mechanism, it's a complement. Uh, and that's because if you if you receive remittances because your son is doing quite well, and if you anticipated that your son was going to do quite well, you probably were in a position of taking more resources from him uh, when he first uh, uh, decided to um, to migrate. So we find this um, um, this association quite uh, clearly in the data, and that's robust uh, um, across um, different ways of uh, controlling for household uh, resources. These were the first, uh, keeping an eye on time, um, these were the first um, set of predictions that build on the data that we've collected, but we were interested in trying to go at the sort of larger question of how this mechanism affects actual migration rates uh, in India and also the elasticity of migration to public investments that are meant to ease uh, movement between different parts of the country. And so, of course, to do that, we, well, not, not of course, but if to do that, we do turn to nationally representative uh, data sets to complement the data that we, uh, that we collected. And so, in an ideal world, you do an experiment where you randomly assign dowry to different uh, districts within India in the 17th century, and then you go back a few centuries later <laughs> to see uh, what happens. We we um, can't exactly no. We we can by far we're very far from being able to do to do that. But we do exploit um, historical data that has been um, gathered by oh, Giuliano and Nan. Sorry, here I need to fix the ordering. Um, on what ancestral tribes of uh, households living in different parts of India today were doing prior to uh, independence, actually prior to um, the British uh, rule um, in the subcontinent. So um, we can identify basically regions that historically practiced a dowry from regions that didn't. And obvious, of course, this was you know an empirical question to us whether the history mattered, because as I said at the beginning, dowry is very popular across India and so we might we want to see whether the fact that your ancestors practiced uh, these type of payments uh, still matters uh, today we we use this uh, Juliana Nan data to construct a dummy of uh, um, basically um, assessing the fraction of people in a district that historically in an Indian district historically practiced uh, dowry and see whether that has any predictive oh, first before I yeah, thanks. Um, we well, let me first show you actually the validation in the interest of time. So we want to see whether historical practice of dowry predicts modern day payments, whether these dowry payments take place at all. And so if I can navigate there. Yeah, perfect. So so we use data from the um, the REDS uh, uh, survey, which is a well used rural um, development uh, survey throughout uh, uh, India to show that indeed if you the if you had um, a positive amount of um, of uh, historical practicing of dowry in your district you're much more likely today to see no, you do see today larger transfers. Unfortunately, the REDS does not allow us to measure the extensive margin because in some parts of the country, missing values and zeros uh, are not separate. So, but at a minimum, what we can say is that on the intensive margin, uh, it does appear that this historical variable captures basically how large this pool of, uh, of resources is. And the areas of the country where this is most, uh, okay, so if I can. Perhaps the battery here is okay. There we go. Um, so we distinguish now between parts of India where historically dowry was uh, popular, and so this would be primarily, as as well known, in some parts of the north and in the um, west, uh, sorry, in the east. But um, um, we also validated uh, through um, additional sources that indeed there are parts of. Um, of Tamil Nadu, where it was it was quite uh, quite widespread, and so we distinguish between these two areas and look for a few, you know, controlling for um, other sort of determinants of local development, whether indeed our two main predictions um, carry through. So one is 
does having historical practices of dowry. So this is not in the present day because that would be endogenous, even more endogenous potentially. Um, uh, but do we observe a correlation between uh, migration of young men and the practice of dowry and, and that we see that on continuous measure and um, also in the, if we, can, if we sort of cut it into dowry, no dowry. And next, what we want to see finally is how this matters for um, urbanization. So we, in particular, we study the effect of one of the largest road construction uh, programs um, taking place in the recent decades, and that is the construction of the Golden uh, Quadrilateral, which connects the four largest Indian cities and began in the early uh, 2000. Let me see, in, I can show you a map. Uh, so this is going to connect um, Delhi with Kolkata, Chennai, and, and Mumbai, and, and also um, connecting the um, east, uh, west, and the north, uh, north, south. This is a staggered rollout design in the sense that of different districts were affected at uh, a different time. We're asking to, I mean, well, one basic question is: Do we see that building these roads promotes the migration from rural areas? The urban and does it matter whether in the sending uh, districts, so in the rural areas, does it matter that the this practice of, of dowry was uh, historically present and therefore young men potentially have, have access to more liquid resources early on right prior to uh, to migrating. And so um, we use a variety of different uh, designs um, to deal with the staggered rollout uh, challenges of sort of difference in difference with a staggered rollout. So here we're showing you one um, based on the design by Boryusiak and Cother, but we work with Callaway and Santana and sort of other sort of state of the art <laughs> diff in diff uh, uh, strategies. And what we what we observe is for um, the population of males that were of an age where migration was still likely. Um, living in a district where dowry was present uh, and having experiencing the arrival of this large road construct uh, road um, system, the golden quadrilateral, led to an increase in the a pretty substantial increase, sort of in the order of six percentage points increase uh, at the at the latest uh, in the latest years, uh, increase in the probability of uh, of migration. By contrast, actually, if we look at men who are somewhat older, we don't see these differences. So this suggests that this there, as perhaps the pre-trends already suggest, that doesn't appear to be driven by sort of pre-existing differences um, between these, these, area, these areas, but indeed um, possibly more to this substantial reduction in the cost of, uh, cost of migration. But it does seem that, that indeed it is these dowry uh, states, uh, districts, sorry. Um, and this here we control also for uh, states by um, time trends uh, effects. So even within a uh, state over time, this uh, this effect uh, persists. So, in sum, and then then I can um, happy to uh, to take questions. Um, we hypothesize the dowry can help compensating parents for who lose the support when their sons uh, migrate. Uh, it does seem indeed that the parents in these communities were at a relatively young age prior to migration sons, thanks due to this institution have access to a pool of liquid uh, resources, tend to take from, from this pool, when particularly when the son uh, migrate, and particularly when the son's earnings potential is highest. So this will be consistent with an intergenerational reciprocity model. Um, and again, what, what, we, what emerges from the national representative data that we're exploiting is that this may have implication for overall migration rates in a country like India. Um, so regions where this payment is more common, common see more, more migration and have greater elasticity to a program like the Golden Quadrilateral that it makes migrating uh, easier. So more generally, sort of what this tells us beyond dowry per se, which is, you know, this pretty important institution within India, but obviously not necessarily uh, relevant out uh, in most other parts of the world, is that though that there exist frictions uh, tied to migration that have to do with old age support, particularly in economies where social security, formal social security systems are not, uh, not developed yet. So uh, we're interested in, in trying to study 
um, a bit more the role in next steps, uh, the role of um, of um, public pension programs in substituting for uh, the support of uh, of children. Um, and the the other point that that we wanted to make is, you know, of course, you know, Dowry is is an interesting institution. It's been sort of debated um, a fair amount. Uh, there's laws to ban it, and in no way we sort of want to take a stance on how it affects uh, other aspects of uh, of Indian society. But at least when it comes to this phenomenon of migration, it points out it plays some role of closing some intergenerational commitment uh, challenge that um, that migration can cause. And so it makes the distribution of resources um, more efficient. And, and potentially, this is what, what we see an indication of, potentially it uh, makes migrating easier, uh, migrating to urban areas easier. Um, there's still some steps I want to take. So somebody raised the, the issue of sisters as a brother. So we're trying to study a bit more how um, particularly sort of when you're raising funds for your sister's <laughs> payments, um, does, how that affects your migration choices, because obviously this is a um, complex uh, uh, two-sided market. Um, and the other, other direction we're hoping to bring this is to look at health outcomes for the elderly. So do we indeed see the parents who have uh, sons in these regions where um, they are more likely to get access to these resources do end up faring better? Uh, health-wise uh, as they age. So that's that's what I have for today. Thank you um, so much. And Robert. I have two questions. Uh, so one is when when these sons move, do their uh, wives go with them, or is it often not the case? Uh, if if they also go with them, I'm thinking there might be implications for the you know the parents of of the wives. Uh, so I'm thinking of parents of uh, of daughters, um, and you know whether the idea or the expectation that the daughter might be moving with the husband uh, who will migrate, whether that has implications for the dowry amount itself. Uh, so, you know, I'm actually married to an Indian. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm, that's why I'm asking this question. I think this, this theory might apply to me because this category of satisfied parents, I think will be uh, <laughs> applicable perhaps. But anyway, I think it's, uh, yeah. I, I wonder about the endogeneity of the dowry so you said there were two, and this was yeah. The first one, the wives go with them. Yeah, thanks. So, um, well, so I, I, there's two phenomena that we also see quite well in the literature. One is of temporary seasonal migration that's quite well studied in development, and that's widespread in India. Um, this is not what we're measuring here in the sense we ask for sort of permanent uh, rural to urban migration. Our sense is that. There, is, there, there are several instances of cases where the woman will stay with the in-laws when the son is temporarily migrating for permanent migration. In our, in our data, that doesn't seem, for example, to be, uh, to be the case. Um, in terms of the parents of daughters, there's a, I mean, this is obviously an important um, point. So one is there's, there's sort of important hypothesis for why this practice exists is the parents of daughters desire to secure a more desirable partner for their uh, their daughter, and so if migration is uh, is potentially um, a mean through which that could happen, um, and indeed in our in our model we can allow the e this endowment to correlate with the earnings potential of the man of the man. Um, one thing that I think is sort of some at the, we haven't modeled explicitly and seems harder to make things perhaps more complex is. Do, for example, daughters know what the bargaining power of their in-laws is when you get married? So, so that that could that's something that we're treating as sort of unobserved at the at the time of uh, of marriage. But um, um, and finally, it's typically not daughter daughters may not be expected to support uh, their parents, but there may be desire of the parents to secure a better. Yeah, thanks.
Um, so thank you for this great presentation. I'm thinking about a paper by Sonia Balotra and co-authors where they exploit variation in the price of gold as an exogenous source of variation in the amount of dowry. Uh, could you use, if you observe the time of marriage and assuming uh, that uh, majority of the dowry is in gold and jewelry, uh, could you also use that and then look at immigration as an outcome? Would that be of interest? Thanks. Uh, this is interesting. So I know in the in I, I know that the very nice uh, very nice paper. Um, from what I they're looking at the price of gold at the time of birth of the woman because you know in some kind of martingale process that that would affect then sort of what's how costly it is when your daughter gets married. Um, but and I think that's because the gold amount I see because the gold amount is fixed. Uh, so perhaps that's something we could we could look into. And so there we would see if you got married. Well, of course. You know, whether you get married in a high gold price here or not might not be entirely random, but it is something that we can think about. Thanks. Thanks a lot. There was a, oh yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm wondering where, whether you also have investigated the heterogeneity in terms of intercaste marriages, especially when a man from a lower caste is married to a uh, woman from a higher caste, will his family contribute more to the marriage? And I, I also think that probably historically um, it was not so common for intercaste marriages, but nowadays uh, it seems to be more uh, more likely to have this kind of marriages in India. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, there are. I mean, we do. We definitely see some of that in our data, and there's a, a strong body of work sort of looking at the determinants of the payment per se. Um, what I don't know sort of within our data is sort of what expense the taking of of the parents. And I, I would expect that, for example, sort of we know that higher educated men do receive, so their families do receive higher dowries, for example. So you'd expect also higher caste men. Men might, in fact, caste itself is. Sean Anderson has worked documenting that, arguing this, seen as a reason why dowry is alive and well, as sort of the competition in this very segmented uh, marriage market. Whether that would affect how much the parents take, um, I think I would, you know, we, we, I would need to, to think sort of theoretically how would that uh, work in the sense of how much utility do the parents get from their son marrying up, for example? Maybe they don't care. Maybe they do. Sort of that's um, that's very interesting. So I was wondering how to think about the the wife's bargaining power in this framework because currently is uh, is a collective model, but between the parents and the son, and we know that the wife are more likely to migrate with the son together. And also, I think like uh, the 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 wife's bargaining power is highly correlated with the dollar amount because that is paid by their uh, family. So I, I understand you show the pie chart, like we have uh, the control of the resources, like a large share by the son and uh, their parents and a small share um, like by the wife. So, but I still think this, uh, like the wife's uh, bargaining power or uh, his decision, her decision in the, like the allocation of the resources is a very important part of the story. So are, are we taking that like, it's a collective model, but it's a collective model between the parents and the children. And if we look at the son, the husband and the wife, we take them as a unit, like unitary uh, decision maker in the framework. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I mean, the setup that we have for simplicity allows for this this e this endowment of the the share that the man takes of the marital surplus as potential intra-household allocation. And so depending on, say, how the marriage surplus is split between men and women in the marriage market, that could be larger or uh, or smaller. I think in our setting, if there are returns to migration that could accrue to the woman as well, she might be supportive of this mechanism existing where some of this money is being used for intergenerational reciprocity. But um, but that's that's sort of most of what, what we can say given the setup that, that we have. Thanks. What a great way to start off the conference. Uh, please join me in thanking Alessandra for a fantastic talk. We have a break now.
Do the session. Great. Super. <laughs> She's from Kolkata. Oh, okay. Yeah, but very western. Uh, yeah. yeah, my my mother-in-law is from Gujarat. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. She migrated um, when she was seventeen. Oh, that's amazing. Like, they married a Belgian man. Really? Belgian British. Wow. 